Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. Are American politics just getting too polarized and too extreme for most Americans? Let's get to the bottom line. Poll after poll shows that Americans have become disillusioned with their own political system and their institutions. On a good day, approval ratings for the president, for Congress, and the Supreme Court really don't rise above 40 percent. The rest of the people are dissatisfied and consider themselves independents, preferring to shop around every election and refusing to commit to either of the two major parties. So is there any way out? Has America become too paralyzed to solve its own problems, just too political and too extreme? My guest today says there's still a chance to fix things. I think he says that. He is Andrew Yang, a businessman and former Democratic presidential candidate in the 2020 election, who left the Democrats to create a brand new party, the Forward Party. And now he's just published his first novel. It's called The Last Election, co-authored with Stephen Marsh. And it paints a dark picture of politics in America today. Andrew, it's a pleasure to have you here with us uh, in studio. I have read the book. It was riveting. It was depressing. And as I said, it was dark. It was really, really dark. Is this the way you see American politics today? Well, it's something we should take very seriously, Steve. And as you read it, you're an expert. A lot of it, you probably scratched your chin thinking, wait, could that happen? And then unfortunately, you came to the realization, yeah, it, it, it very well could. I did run for president in the last cycle and got a sense of the mechanics of our politics. There are a lot of Americans who feel like they're on the outside looking in. And the polarization is getting stronger, not weaker. So as you look at this and you're telling the story, I'd like you to take our viewers who haven't yet read the book into the, into the background of this, why you wrote this, and what are the, some of the standout features that you say are eroding our democracy right now? Uh, it's ironic I say it uh, on this platform, but a lot of it is the media. <laughs> no, I know. I felt the pressure. I felt, I, I felt you go right after me. <laughs> well, so when I, I ran for president, that was one of the biggest realizations. Uh, and uh, unfortunately now our relationship with the media is itself very partisan and polarized. About 69 percent of Democrats have a high trust in the media, and then 15 percent of Republicans do. So you see that vast gulf. And what I didn't realize, but a lot of Americans now are, are coming to, is that the party system and media operates very, very uh, much hand in glove. Well, you started, I mean, I, I remember you on Joe Rogan, that you went on some of these new media um, uh, folks. Uh, it wasn't my show, but it was Joe Rogan's show and did very, very well, built a brand, came out, began, you know, talking in, you know, in very refreshing ways for many Americans. So is it really the media or are there parts of the media that you think provide kind of waves around, um, if you will, the stagnancy or the kind of uh, chokehold that a lot of the traditional media have over you getting your voice out? Well, I did use independent media. And I, you know, despite what I just said, I mean, I think you all do a really exceptional job. Uh, it's one reason why a lot of Americans are now turning to you for their news. Um, but... The parties now have taken on either a pro-institution or anti-institutional bent. And so a lot of Americans now think that corporate media is part of the set of institutions that doesn't want certain things to happen, that mm. favors some people and narratives over others. And when I was coming up as a candidate, I definitely did turn to a lot of podcasters who weren't part of that constellation. So when you ran, did you feel that they were racist, biased? What were, what were the... You know, what was the, the game that they set up against you? Well, in my case, and someone can look this up, I mean, there, there were times when they would just leave me out. Huh. <laughs> I think that's actually a fairly, uh, fairly common move. Um, but there are certain candidates where they're very much approved and promoted, and then others that they'd kind of prefer you don't pay attention to. Well, when I read the, the last election, and, and I may get some of this wrong, I'm still trying to process a lot of what's in the book, there's a you know a kind of semi-libertarian successful guy who basically is a pragmatic you know problem solver who is somewhat the center of of of, of the book. Um, if you want to call him the hero, maybe the anti-hero. He's 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 in that, and and uh, his name is uh, Cooper Sherman, and I assume that's you. Um, it's a mixture of me and other people. You obviously write what yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's sort of like it seemed like you in that in that in that book. But it really is depressing because you sort of see the trail of someone with good ideas, powerful ideas, running into essentially the corruption and stranglehold of a two-party system and what that, 
what, what that creates and how hard it is to change that. You've created a third party, the forward party. We have a lot of talk in America right now about no labels, about other third party efforts. And everyone comes out that I know of and disparages them right away, as opposed to looking at the power of ideas that someone brings or the disruptive thinking they may bring to some you know, challenge that we have in society or, you know, like you did with universal basic income. How are we going to think about an age when we just won't have enough jobs for everyone? How do we deal with rewarding uh, and keeping the, the society solvent? So is this essentially a future where ideas don't matter and kind of corrupt franchises do? Well, that's what Americans are trying to figure out right now. If you have AI coming online, what are we going to do about it? Uh, there are challenges that are getting more and more serious and powerful. In our government, it feels like it's always behind the curve. And that lag time is becoming a bigger and bigger problem. So when people talk about third parties, and here's what our innovation is with the forward party, when the people think about third parties, what do they think? Presidential election. Right. And we, the forward party, are emphasizing city council, mayors, races, even school board races. There are about 500,000 elected positions in this country. Majority of them go uncontested and uncompetitive in any given cycle. So we're trying to create an option on the ground where it can actually have an impact on people's lives before we tackle anything at the national level. We think that's what people want. Who do you think is the Andrew Yang of this election? Is it Vivek Ramaswamy? So one of the frustrations that a lot of Americans feel right now, Steve, let's say you, you want an alternative to Joe Biden and the Democratic Party. Probably not going to see it or get it because the DNC is not even holding debates. There's not going right. to be much of a process. On the Republican side, there's Donald Trump looming over the whole thing, up by 43 points over his closest rival. So even as we're tuning into these debates, there's a sense that will this matter? And the bigger proceedings are happening in some courtroom somewhere <laughs> as to whether or not Trump you know, um, makes it to election day. But if he does make it to election day, it's probably going to be as the Republican nominee. Hmm. Um, so the frustration Americans feel is that if you have a Biden-Trump rematch, combined age 160 in 2024, two-thirds of Americans aren't excited about either alternative. And so how the heck in a country of 300 million plus do you wind up with two choices that very few of us want? <laughs> Folks, you may have read the Constitution. People around the world have read the American Constitution. There is a section in there that if one of the candidates does not get to 270 Electoral College votes or the certain majority that, that's needed uh, uh, in the um, Electoral College, there's no rerun. There's no redo of the election. It goes to another process. And the vice president of the United States is elected by a, you know, one senator at a time in the United States Senate. And the president is elected by the House of Representatives, one state at a time in this. And how close are we to something like that actually happening? Now, we've been living with the two-party system throughout our uh, adult yeah. lives. And so you don't think, hey, what happens if you have someone not get a majority? Uh, but we found out about the contingent election because... Uh, there are folks who've been trying to disaster plan and scenario plan for what the heck happens if you have, let's say, multiple candidates and no one gets to a majority. And in that instance, you wind up exactly with the process you described, which would be a shocker to most Americans. And I am so But it's pleased. in the Constitution. I know. Yeah. We've seen when President Trump was in office try to raise questions about the Electoral College certification process, something that people thought was a ritual and not touchable. You just kind of go through and do it. How many rituals do we have built into the political system that could be undone? There are a lot of them, unfortunately. And when you actually get down to brass tacks and you realize how much of it is ritual and how much of it is codified, you find out that we're much more dependent on ritual than I think a lot of Americans would, would like to believe. Um, I'll, I'll tell you one major example. There's not a word about the Republican Party or the Democratic Party in the Constitution. Our founding fathers were famously anti-partisan. George Washington warned about parties on the way out in his farewell mm -hmm. address. John Adams said two parties would be an evil across the land. We're living a version of our founding fathers' worst nightmare, and those nightmares are going to come to fruition, unfortunately, in the not-so-distant future, unless we were to, let's say, modernize our political elections with ranked choice voting or some other system that would allow for new forces to come in that don't end up leading to, uh, to results Americans don't actually want. This is the opportunity. So here's the fiction yeah. that Americans have. Our leaders have to make 51% of us happy 
to stay in office. Generally not true. Generally speaking, our leaders have to make 10 to 12 percent of the most polarized base voters happy in their primaries, mm -hmm. and then their job security is assured. So the way out of this bind we're in is to say anyone can vote for anyone of any party in an all-party primary, and then you choose the winner. So give us an example, because we do have a couple of those, right? I think in Louisiana, don't we have one? I'll use the Alaska yeah. example because okay. I love it so yeah. much. Uh, so you had uh, multiple people run for Congress. It was Sarah Palin, another Republican, and then a Democratic legislator named Mary Peltola. Mm. And people could vote for more than one candidate. So they could say, hey, I'm going to rank um, Mary 1, uh, Sarah Palin 2 if they wanted, though they're quite different people. So that would be a kind of a weird ranking. <laughs> and, and the yeah. great thing about ranked choice voting is then you can vote for whomever you like. There's no spoiler effect. No saying, hey, you're going to waste your vote. And this way, the winner gets majority support, but also you can allow new points of view to emerge and everyone's vote is actually counted. You know, so you had that happen. And in Alaska, you basically saw Sarah Palin go down and you had someone else come up. And I know in Louisiana, you have folks like Bill Cassidy, Senator Bill Cassidy, who's able to be somewhat of a, you know, basically call, said, you know, vote for Donald Trump's uh, uh, impeachment and survive in a, in a state like Louisiana. Lisa Murkowski in Alaska yeah. as well voted yeah. for Trump's impeachment and survived. And if you think about it in the presidential, let's say you're not excited about either Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Let's imagine a system where you could rank some other person one and then um, Biden two, uh, hypothetically, and then not be worried about wasting your vote. Right now, the two-party system is trying to keep everything in place in an era when everything else is changing. And so we're going to get either the bad version of the change or the good version of the change. And the book, uh, not to give anything away, but the book does present what I think is going to happen unless we actually modernize our system. You know, I think I grew up, I mean, I, I think in all the elections I have voted in, I took them seriously. I knew there were consequences one way or another. I've never voted party line. I've always been an independent candidly, and I've seen real structural problems in both parties. So I've been there way, way uh, before it was a fad and before I, you know, had the privilege of knowing you. But you now see, you know, these elections used to be kind of benign events, almost exciting events, you know, opportunities, you know, contests. You say now elections are, are to be feared in some senses. Well, that's the way a lot of uh, Americans feel, but half of Americans now self-identify as independents, Steve, so you're in very good company, and that number is going up and up because more people are waking up to the fact that the two-party system is not responsive to us, it doesn't actually have solutions for the challenges of the day. And so the question is, are we going to be able to actually evolve our system to something that will listen to us, get in front of challenges like AI? Uh, it's a big challenge because the two-party system has a lot keeping it in place. But on the other side, you have tens, even hundreds of millions of Americans who will want something better for ourselves and our children. You know, one of the elements of your fictional novel that, that it starts with is a potential, it's, it's, it's really, you know, somebody in the New York Times gets a Dropbox tape of a conversation. I'll tell folks I can tease this a little bit without saying, and, and, and part of it is taking out uh, the Proud Boys, taking out Black Lives Matter, looking at both extremes out there and seeing essentially, you know, national security forces coming in and taking democracy away because it's become a horrible place. How close do you think we are to some vision like that? If you look at the most trusted institutions in American life, the U.S. military is one of the only ones that right now is coming in above 50 percent. Hmm. And there are folks in the military who uh, are looking around saying, what is the appropriate role? Um, now, many of them, in my opinion, correctly are saying, look, we should uh, continue our proud tradition of civilian leadership. Uh, but then there are others who are looking around um, and in our novel saying, look, maybe we should also disaster scenario plan. And what the heck does that look like? And if you had a major journalistic institution who might have a sense that something like that was even a possibility, what would their responsibility be? Do you think that parents today can have confidence that the future uh, for their children will be better than what they enjoyed? Uh, it, it motivates me every day, Steve. Uh, I'm the child of immigrants, and when I was running for president, I asked crowds of hundreds, even thousands of people, what is the American dream? Mm -hmm. The American dream is just that your kids are gonna have a better life than you did. And at this point, most Americans are deeply unsure whether that's a reality. And by the numbers, 50% of Americans 
uh, won't do better than their kids will. And that's at, you know, right now at the, the present. And those trends, unfortunately, might be getting worse, not better. So in that environment, what does American politics look like? What is the response that people can legitimately say, I feel worse about the future than I do about the past? And as you talk about immigrants, has this become a toxic and hostile place to immigration? And America, let's face it, part of our tradition was we were the brain drain problem for the rest of the world because yeah. the world's best minds came here. Yeah, and, and that's what brought my parents here. My parents met as students at UC Berkeley. My mm -hmm. dad got his PhD in physics and generated 69 U.S. patents for GE and IBM. And the question is, does America still have that kind of magnetic attraction mm -hmm. for talented people around the world, or do they think they're better served trying to uh, start a business or a family someplace else. If you lose that, you lose our competitive edge for generations. Tell me about the forward party. How is it doing? Is it listed as the forward party? Because one of the other interesting dimensions of the book, which I don't want to get into, is the Maverick Party was out there, but sometimes those that supported Maverick Party candidates were Democrats. Some of the supported them were Republicans. And so you had a kind of flagging challenge, if you did, uh, in the novel. I'll leave it at there. But do you have a flagging challenge with the forward party? Um, you know, the Maverick Party name was a, was like a, a, a bit of an inside joke for my friend Mark Cuban, <laughs> who oh. owns the Dallas Mavericks. But, uh, and also, by the way, I think he would make a fantastic presidential candidate if he ever uh. decides to run. Um, but so the, you heard the, it here, Mark Cuban, you, you, would, you would think he'd be great. I, I definitely am yeah. part of the draft yeah. Cuban campaign. Um, but um, the forward party is attracting independents, uh, Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, you name it. We have 35 elected officials now, mayors district attorneys, uh, wow. county executives, state legislators. Uh, and it's not left or right, but forward, which is where most people watching this want to go. And the question is, how are we going to get there? Uh, is it going to be from within this two-party system that's pulling us apart and turning us against each other? Or are we going to have a different dynamic? Uh, and one of the jokes I tell is, imagine a sporting league where you only had two teams. How would the fan bases feel about each other over time? They mm. probably start to dislike each other a lot. That's what America feels like right now. And so one of the ways out is to have uh, another alternative that can help change the, the dynamic. Is there something unique and compelling about a business person running for office as opposed to, you know, the governors, the legislators, those that have held public office before? You know, Vivek Ramaswamy is making a bit of a stir right now. You certainly did. Donald Trump came from the business sector as well. What is appealing, do you think, to Americans about business leaders coming into this game? I think in the best possible light, uh, some business leaders genuinely just want to solve problems and make things work better, and they're not motivated by the trappings uh, of office. Um, now, some that's not true for. <laughs> and, and so it, it's, you know, business leaders are just like any other type of person. There's some great ones and some not as great ones. But one of the things that makes Americans super sad now is the sense that our system is being held hostage by uh, corporate interests and various um, lobbying money. Uh, and I think that in some circles, they think a business leader is going to be more immune to that kind of influence. You have a dark force, dark money billionaire in this book, and I'm not going to say much about him because I think I know who it is uh, in real life or who in party is inspired by. But it raises the question for me, how much of that kind of dark player with lots of money who's thinking in triple level chess on how to create chaos do you believe really exists in Americans, uh, American politics today? Uh, unfortunately, it's pretty close to the truth. I mean, there's some bad actors, and we have a very, very vulnerable system. 85% of Americans would like to see less money in politics, not mm -hmm. more. Unfortunately, right now, it's hard to get there because you need a constitutional amendment. But if we had a better system, maybe we could accomplish that and make ourselves less susceptible to one super wealthy person who wants uh, to see their agenda enacted. White nationalism is one of the other forces uh, very active in the pages of this fictional novel. How much of that white nationalism do you think permeates uh, the American political scene today? And how much did you run into when you were actually running? When I was running, I experienced very, very little uh, hostility or racism. There are a lot of folks who are actually very open to my campaign that weren't, let's say, traditional uh, Democrats mm -hmm. um, or even moderates, honestly. Um, but white nationalism is a very real force, and it, it's getting stronger in large part because we are decimating the way of life for a lot of uh, rural communities and places that maybe were dependent upon 
manufacturing or coal or some other industry. Hmm. You, one of the other things I like about the candidate who's the story in this, they keep saying, do the math, do the math. You know, as, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, a I, bit of a call out. Yeah, I knew it, where that was coming from. <laughs> but as you sort of look at the, the, you know, the slogans that you see coming in today, and I really love the way, and I agree with, frankly, the way you framed the you know, two sets of choices that seem to be percolating uh, within the Republican Party. I keep telling my audience, it's not over till it's over. Yeah. But, but you know, you've got two people basically on, on opposite sides of 80 years old, but very, very much up there. And I'm just interested in how you think, you know, is there an alternative scenario? I gave you credit for maybe having an idea of seeing a fix for this outside of this dismal set of choices. What is that if, there, if it does exist? Uh, so in a better system, we'd have multiple choices and you'd be excited about more than mm -hmm. one of them and then you could rank them. Now, unfortunately, that's not a 2024 proposition. Right. Um, could it be a 2028 proposition? I think there's an outside possibility it could. There are other countries, let's say Australia, who use ranked choice voting for the, their national races. How can Australia accomplish something and the United States cannot? Hmm. And the reason is that the United States political system does not have an interest in upgrading itself, even though more and more of us are waking up to the need. You were a candidate. I, I used to love listening to you in the debate. So you were a candidate about hope, prospects, let's build something. Um, Donald Trump came in as a candidate, you know, stirring up fear. We've seen other players like that. I would put, you know, uh, Dick Cheney uh, in, in that mix somewhat. That, that there, is, there seem to be templates that some politicians bring in. Build in positive future. Ronald Reagan was a hope guy. Uh, others are fear folks or are, you know, more cynical. Which works better in America right now? <laughs> Unfortunately, I think scarcity is winning, which means fear is winning. Hmm. Um, and the book is a warning, uh, as you say. When I was running for office, I was saying some very bleak things. I was talking about AI decimating jobs, and yet people still believed and felt me to be optimistic and hopeful, which is something I really appreciated. Uh, I'm trying to build our way out of this mess. I think that's the American way. Mm. But to get there, you're gonna have to actually uh, recognize the reality of the mess we're in. How do you see things going? Is Donald Trump gonna win this next race, you think? Uh, I think there's a very real possibility he does win this next race, in, in large part because uh, you might have multiple third-party candidates in the race, uh, and they may pull a little bit more from Joe than from Trump. Uh, even straight up, it's not, um, it's not that big a gap um, where they're tied in recent polls. And the way our system right now is structured is the Democrat actually has to win by a couple of points in order to win the Electoral College. Well, I want to say it's a real pleasure to have you. Not left, not right, just forward. Thank you so much for being with us. Andrew Yang, former Democratic candidate for president, co-chair of the Forward Party, and now author of the political thriller, The Last Election. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Steve. It's been a pleasure. So what's the bottom line? The game of politics, well, it's a rough sport in any country. But the question my guest Andrew Yang is provoking today goes really far beyond the issues of national unity and the weakness of democracy. He's worried that a new narrative is taking hold in America. One, that autocracy could be more effective than messy democracy. Two, a nation that believes that might makes right. And three, a place where fascism actually becomes popular. In his novel, he paints a dark scenario about how a wealthy political minority could seal its victory and dominate America. Literally, the last election ever. Sure, it's far-fetched, but sometimes Truth is stranger than fiction, especially when the wobbliness of Americans' own democratic process is so obvious to everyone. And that's the bottom line.